Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker for today, the second day of our Nobel Conference, Dr. Manuela Bajeto. Dr. Bajeto is a full professor of social and organizational psychology at the University of Exeter in the UK, as well as researcher at the Wellcome Center for Cultures and Environments of Health. She was born in Portugal and received her PhD from the Free University in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. She's an expert in the intersections of marginalization, identity, and stigma, especially its impact on health and well-being. One of her major contributions to the field was serving as co-investigator for the BBC's Loneliness Project, which surveyed more than 50,000 people across the world. Some of the project's key findings were that young people were the group that felt the loneliest, and that people who were discriminated against were more likely to feel lonely. Three of her most recent articles were Stigma, Identity, and Support in Social Relationships of Transgender People Throughout Transition, and Exploring the Nature and Variation of the Stigma Associated with Loneliness, and Are We Doing Enough to Address Loneliness in Adolescence? Her research is extremely relevant for us to understand the issues facing young adults today and their impact on mental health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bachet. Thank you very much to all of the organizers and the students and everybody who is taking part in making this happen today, and not the least the audience, without whom, well, this would just be silly, really. Um, <laughs> So, um, yes, I am here today to talk to you a little bit more about loneliness and obviously uh, the relationship between loneliness and mental health. Uh, and what I want to do today, aside from giving you some of the basics, because obviously I have no idea what people already know about the subject, is to try and challenge us to think about loneliness a little bit differently from how we are led to think about it by the media uh, and also, in fact, by a lot of the academic work on the topic. So I want to uh, make us think about loneliness not as a deficit in individuals, but in fact a deficit in communities, a social justice issue that we can and should motivate it to address. Okay, let's see. So first of all, what is loneliness? Um, now, there is not one definition of loneliness. There are many, and I'm sure each of us ha has our own idea of what loneliness is for us. But that said, there are some definitions that we use in the literature, and the one at the top here is the one most used, uh, the idea that it's an aversive feeling, and it's related to the discrepancy that we experience between the kinds of relationships we would like to have and the ones we actually perceive that we do have. So that is sort of pretty dry, but a definition to start with. The second one I put in there because it's the one that most chimes with my own feelings when I feel lonely, which is the idea of the experienced lack of empathic understanding. It's also how many people feel when they feel lonely, but of course people feel in different ways, which is also why we like to listen to how people describe their own feelings of loneliness. Now, a couple of notes as well, because people may have heard about this kind of distinctions. Yes, we do just sometimes distinguish between transient and chronic loneliness, and the difference between the two is just one of how long have we had this feeling. Transient loneliness is perfectly normal, we have it a lot, hard to capture in surveys or experiments or any other type of study because it's transient, um, and usually given very little importance because that's not the one that is associated with all of the negative effects of loneliness. Chronic loneliness lasts a longer time and it's then the one that tends to be problematic. Um, people also talk about emotional and social loneliness a lot. Uh, the terms are a little uh, confusing because, of course, loneliness is always something social and it's always something emotional, but the, the labels tend to refer to emotional being a lack of intimacy with someone and social being social networks or friendship networks that we are not happy with. So, as I said, we like to also listen to what people say when they speak about their feelings of loneliness. So I put in here a, a few quotes 
from a study we have done across five countries in Europe with uh, 14 to 16 year olds, um, telling us how is lonely, what is loneliness for them, how do they experience it. And so there's other kinds of things people say. It's a big sadness when you cannot find someone to help you or to share your sorrow. You feel alone, sad, misunderstood, not heard. And the other one I can't read. <laughs> but hopefully you can. Um, so this, um, although different from those more drier definitions that I've just shown you, um, they do connect to those in, through the idea of lack of connection, right? Now, can loneliness ever be positive? That's one of the first questions I get asked. Is the microphone still working? Yeah. Is one of the first questions I get asked is, can loneliness ever be positive? And of course, we do see people also saying positive things about their experiences of loneliness. So these are quotes that we got from the BBC Loneliness Experiment that was mentioned earlier, uh, where we also had some open questions and people could actually tell us how it felt for them. Um, so people will talk about it as a stimulus to reconnect, an opportunity for reflection and personal growth, an opportunity to engage in meaningful activities, or time out from the world. Now, when does loneliness become a problem then, if it can be positive and it can be negative? Now, we can look at the evolutionary theory of loneliness that was developed by uh, one of your um, uh, American scholars um, that speaks of loneliness as functional. So it's, it's a way of signaling to people that they need to do something to address a need that is very fundamental to them. So it should make you motivated to reconnect, and therefore, and, and after that, subsequently, it should make you reconnect. Because being on your own is not a good thing, evolutionarily speaking. It's not safe, and it's not um, um, efficient. So the problem is, people don't always have the opportunity or the capacity to reconnect. So think of um, people who don't have the financial resources to socialize with their peers. And this happens a lot in adolescence, and young people don't have necessarily their own resources and sometimes have very little access to resources to keep up with the kinds of social activities their peers are doing. Think of um, lack of time. So informal carers, for example, often complain about having no time to do anything aside from caring and then resting from the caring. So actually socializing um, is, is, there's no time for. Or for example, restricted mobility or even lack of transportation. So think of people who are chronically ill and have very little capacity to move around. In addition to the opportunity, there's also the capacity. So people might um, be too afraid to engage in social interactions. Um, they might not speak the language. They might not understand the norms that are prevalent and valued and respected in their surrounding. So in these cases, loneliness does not lead to reconnection. It leads to more loneliness and then becomes a self-fulfilling cycle and which is where the problem arises. So feeling lonely is fine as long as you can get out of it, right? So that is ultimately the message. Why do we care about loneliness though? Why do we care? Well, first of all, because it's prevalent. It's quite common. So, sound? Okay. So, uh, for example, this is data from Europe, um, where we saw that pre-pandemic, uh, between 6 and 13% of the population over 18 was feeling very lonely. Post-pandemic, or during the pandemic, that went up to 22 to 26%, which is, you know, quite high, quite high. Data from the US shows that compared to other causes of concern, loneliness is a lot more prevalent. And importantly, and um, as was already mentioned during my introduction, it's not just a problem of old age. So this is data from the UK, from the Office for National Statistics, which is drawn from representative populations, whereas the data that was mentioned earlier from my own BBC loneliness experiment was not from a representative population, but it was from a very big sample from all over the world, so it, it matters in that way. But this is from a representative population, and basically what you're seeing here is that, first of all, people can feel lonely at any age, but second, the people who feel most lonely are actually lonely people. 
This is from 2018, pre-pandemic. But what we also see with, with data collected during the pandemic is that Actually, everybody felt more lonely, but any discrepancies remained. So if you imagine a graph showing a difference, it just went up, but the, the, the difference remained. So a quick note on prevalence estimates, because after all, um, I am an academic and I, for some reason, care about these things. Um, so I just want to pause because we see a lot uh, of um, media attention to numbers this many people feel lonely, that many people feel lonely, and the numbers tend to be very different from each other. So I just wanted to pause briefly to reflect on how we should look at those numbers. So prevalence estimates are very hard to get right. Uh, and when it comes to feelings, emotions, and things that actually are very often very hard to admit to experiencing, that's even trickier, right? So. Um, how many of you here would say that you feel lonely? Mm, maybe now that I'm talking about it <laughs> more than before, but um, not many people would just straight out say, I feel lonely, uh, or I feel lonely a lot of the time. Uh, so it really depends on how it's measured. And these three items that you have in there are examples of how this is usually measured. And in fact, in very large scale studies, it is very, really these items that are used. The options are never, sometimes, often, always. The options also matter. If people, instead of asking you how often you feel lonely, they actually ask you how intensely do you feel loneliness, you will get very different results. So when people are saying 20% of people feel lonely or 50% of people feel lonely, you need to think about, well, exactly what was the question, right? Um, we also need to think about who was asked. Um, so. How representative was the sample? Now, if you say 20% of the people in my class feel lonely, that's very valuable as, a, as evidence of how many people in your class feel lonely, but it's not a evidence about how many 16-year-olds or 20-year-olds feel lonely, right? Because it's not a sample drawn from the whole population of people in that age. So, little bracket here. Now, let's get back to loneliness. So why do we care? Because it's prevalent, as I've already said, but also because it has a whole host of negative consequences. Now, I could speak for hours about this because there's a lot of evidence for this and it's quite interesting, but um, I want to move on. And so I will just give you some indications of what these consequences might be. So stress, sleep disturbances, depression, suicide, addiction, heart disease, inflammation, dementia, and premature death are some of the um, illustrative examples here. So this has led some to uh, claim and argue for loneliness to be considered a public health priority. Um, but there are consequences beyond the individual. So the individual suffers from their loneliness experience, but so do employers, so do societies, so do communities. So in the UK, for example, there has been a calculation, this is what economists like to do, a calculation of how much it costs to employers in the UK to, um, for, for people to experience loneliness. Um, there's also costs to democracy because people get more withdrawn and they care less about society and they might not vote, for example. Um, also costs more, more general to society, for example, due to the uh, healthcare services that are then required to meet the needs, and it weakens communities. So this is why we care. If we care, and if it's so problematic, then what are we doing about it? Well, uh, if you want to, at some point, Google loneliness prevention or something like that, you will find quite a lot of hits just like this. The hits that tell you what you could do about feeling lonely. It's about um, what you should do. A lot of mental health char charities share this kind of idea as well. You can go out more. You can um, think differently about social life. You can get a pet. Um, now, perhaps unsurprisingly, 
uh, well, sorry, this is uh, just to show you that the, the, the vast amount of strategies that exist out there and that people talk about can more or less be grouped in this kind of category. So psychological therapies or cognitive behavioral therapy uh, to challenge your ideas about uh, the social world, which is what people call maladaptive social cognitions, um, to improve your social skills. There's also training to become better, so, a, so, a better social being, you know, better social skills, befriending services, people who go to people's houses to, to have chats and to try and get them out of the house, and just generally campaigns encouraging people to get out more, join groups, volunteer, all sorts of things that are social in nature. But there's little evidence for the efficacy of these interventions. And we might be surprised about why there are so many interventions that are not very effective, but the reason why, I argue, is that they are based on a dominant approach that ignores the context in which loneliness emerges. It's all focused on people's personality, people's social skills, their self-esteem or lack thereof, and helpful cognitions, their mental health. So this idea is about loneliness as a product of individual deficits that require solutions at the individual level. It's about the lonely person as a thing, different from the non-lonely person. And it's about what can be done about them, to them, by them as individuals. Now, I argue that feeling left out, which is core to the feeling of loneliness, is not just in someone's head. One of the papers that is quite well known um, uh, on the topic is actually called It's All in Their Mind. That's the dominant approach. But I argue that, as I said, feeling left out is not just in someone's head. It's often not caused by their, their, their own thoughts or their own behavior. It's often actually reflecting real social exclusion. And it can be at the interpersonal, at the institutional, um, at the community, or even at the policy level. So current interventions address only a very small part of this. So just the ones we were talking about, they're really just there in those little circles. What about all the others? So I think to, to do better, we need to consider the socio-ecology of our relational life. Um, it also, it, this idea is also problematic because it's very stigmatizing. It portrays the, lonely, the person who feels lonely as this sad, inept individual that resents the world and turns against the others, the idea of the violent incel or the crazy cat lady or the sad, lonely old person. Of course, this is not only sad in itself, but it also adds to the loneliness the burden of moral reproach. So why do we have such a narrow focus? Again, this is something we could talk about for quite a while, but a couple of ideas is that, first of all, it's very relatable. Loneliness feels personal. It feels very much as something that you are feeling as an individual, and so it's relatable. It's, it, it's something that makes sense to us. It's also appealing because it gives you a sense of control. If it is a person's fault that they feel lonely, then clearly I can steer out of it because I will behave in ways that help me avoid it. But more importantly, it's consistent with prevailing ideologies, and particularly neoliberalism and individualism. So the in inherent idea of competition between people, personal responsibility, um, really make us draw, draw our attention to the individual and away from any, more other, any other structural factors. But this narrative is not only misguided in the sense that it doesn't really capture the whole picture, but it's also problematic because it can increase loneliness. So we know that both historically and cross-culturally, where there's more individualism, where there's more neoliberalism, there is more loneliness. So we need a shift. And um, I think the shift we need to make is to go beyond considering just factors at individual level as drivers of loneliness. And funny enough, research is showing those. It's just that they're not very well um, talked about, very well considered when thinking of interventions. So for example, aside from those that I've already shown you at the top, there's all of these other uh, factors that are already evidenced to be important in causing loneliness. 
So in the rest of the talk, I want to focus on this shift to consider loneliness as not a deficit of individuals, but as a deficit in communities, and particularly the role of marginalization and stigma. Uh, as someone very recently wrote in the British newspaper, The Guardian, talking about mental health, but I think it can really be very easily transposed here to the topic of loneliness, um, if a plant were wilting, we wouldn't diagnose it with wilting plant syndrome. We would change its conditions. This is really, I think, what we're talking about. So to start doing this, we need to first consider that loneliness is patterned by a whole host of social factors. So if it were just an issue of individuals, it wouldn't be patterned in this way, right? So, for example, it's geographically patterned. So in America, this, um, this picture is showing where the highest levels and the lowest levels of loneliness are experienced. I, um, this is a map of the UK, and there, <laughs> that's Exeter where I work. Um, a map of the UK also showing the patterning of loneliness due to geographical distribution. We don't need to go into detail. The idea here is really just it's patterned. Um, why this variation across communities? Because communities do differ in drastic ways. And um, it, within communities, people also have different experiences. So these are some of the ways in which communities differ. So um, poverty and unemployment rates differ across communities. Spatial features. Uh, I will go in that in, um, into that in more detail in a minute. A sense of neighborhood and a stigma regarding minorities vary very much across neighborhoods. So when it comes to poverty, for example, this is data from the Wales Centre for Public Policy um, showing that the more deprivation in a given area, the more the people who live there report feeling lonely. Uh, Regarding spatial features, uh, different studies are showing that uh, we need appropriate and safe and accessible places to meet, particularly young people. Um, they need to be accessible, you need to be able to walk around in those places, they need to be safe. If there is no lighting, who is going to use those places? Um, so in this particular graph, what we see is that being able to walk around in a neighborhood uh, especially for older people with depression, really decreased the loneliness that they experienced. Um, sense of neighborhood. Some neighborhoods have more of a sense of neighborhood. You go into the neighborhood and you feel, hmm, this is cozy, and other neighborhoods don't. And uh, people can very much sense that. So in, in our BBC Loneliness Experiment, we asked people to what extent they felt that their neighborhood had that feeling, that feeling of trust in your neighbors. And the more people reported feeling lonely, um, the less the sense of neighborhood or the other way around as well. And the hopeful aspect here is that a lot more people reported a low sense of neighborhood. So there's plenty we can do there to improve things. But what's in a neighborhood? Well, um, there are some studies, and there's a very interesting and impressive paper, for example, uh, by Matthews and colleagues that shows that there's nothing objective about neighborhoods that is causing loneliness in people. Aside from questioning that from some of the other evidence that I've already talked about, I also question that what, what's in a neighborhood must be seen as objective because people have very different experiences in neighborhoods. For example, in this particular study, and uh, apologies for the rather difficult graph, but really what you need to see here is that to what extent you as a, as a family are deprived in that neighborhood really matters to the sense to which you feel the neighborhood is cohesive. So if you're deprived, that same neighborhood seems less cohesive than if you're less deprived. And ethnicity matters. If you belong to a minority group, an ethnic minority group in that neighborhood, you feel that the neighborhood is less of a neighborhood, less cohesive. Um, this is data from the same paper that shows that racial minorities during the beginning stages of COVID were reporting a lot of racial insults, insults and attacks in their neighborhood. So no wonder that they are having very different experiences in the same neighborhood than those who are not racial minorities. Um, loneliness disparities exist also across a whole host of other categories, and these are just two more examples to make sure that we do think of this as more broadly about disadvantage rather than just about a particular group. When it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity, we see those disparities emerge as well. 
a lot more loneliness when you belong to a group that is less valued and potentially a minority. So the BBC Loneliness, Ex loneliness Experiment, as was already said, had a lot of data. There were over 55,000 participants, depending also on the part of the study. And what that gave us um, was the ability to do analysis we wouldn't otherwise be able to do, like this one, which used 32 predictors uh, using computational modeling. And we were then able to see wh whether what was the strongest predictor and the hierarchy of strength in predicting loneliness between these variables and their interactions. And really the strongest predictor was daily experiences with prejudice and discrimination. Out of 32 predictors, it was not living alone, as people often think, it was not personality. It was experiences with stigma. Those other two that I'm pointing out there are relational mobility, to the extent to which people keep having to change their social networks, or culturally value changing their, sex, their, their social networks, um, and social capital. So social factors, not personality factors. There's also longitudinal evidence for the powerful effect of experiences with racism in this case over time to uh, increasing depression and feelings of loneliness. So, um, structural stigma is also extremely important to consider because stigma is not always, not always about interpersonal relationships. Um, it can actually characterize whole systems such as institutions, uh, states, countries, schools, workplaces. Um, and this uh, European Community uh, Commission report really just shows that um, the areas where more loneliness are, is expressed are the same uh, or similar to the areas where people perceive their society to be most exclusive. And with our BBC data, we actually were able to also test this by uh, using um, ILGA scores, which are scores um, of structural stigma towards uh, sexual minorities, and um, uh, at the country level. And so uh, there's, uh, the score exists for 113 countries. So we, have, we uh, coded the countries in, uh, uh, on the basis of this uh, score index. Um, and we saw that the predictive value of structural stigma existed over and above daily interpersonal experiences with discrimination. And this applied at all ages. It didn't matter how young, middle-aged or old you were, your daily experiences with stigma and the structural stigma present in the country where you live predicted how loneliness you felt and how much trust you had in your neighbors. Structural stigma can also function as what we call a moderator. It can change or exacerbate the relationship between interpersonal episodes of discrimination and how lonely you feel as a, as a result of that. And why does it do this? Well, there's various mechanisms here, just three. One, it pushes people out. If you are excluded, why would we be surprised that you feel left out? It makes people feel undeserving, and that might lead people to withdraw via lowered self-esteem, social anxiety, anxiety hypervigilance, stress. Remember the first category of predictors I talked about earlier, the hypersensitivity, the poor social skills. So they actually come from somewhere. So they actually can come from your negative social experiences like experiences with stigma, the context of loneliness. Also, there are dominant notions of what it means to be sociable that are really about structural stigma. So if, if all we value in sociality is particular ways of being social, then all the others are wrong, excluded, pushed out. And we can refer back to our discussions on autism yesterday, but also cultural differences, ethnic and racial differences in how people value relating to each other. So what are the implications of this shift? I'm sure you can already imagine some for yourself in the context where you live, but first of all, if loneliness is socially patterned, if loneliness is so closely related to experiences with discrimination, then we need to see loneliness not just as a public health issue, but as a social justice issue. The responsibility must be not on the individual suffering from loneliness, it must be on the communities that are not taking care of including these individuals.
We need to think about certain things about our community that can help, and these are some examples. Social spaces that are safe and accessible, well-lit and well-maintained parks. What kind of people will join um, each other in a, in a place that looks like the above? What mothers and fathers with young children will go to that playground? They'll stay at home and feel separate and lonely. What kind of people will join the one below? I think I would, and I have no, no babies, but I would, <laughs> a bit creepy. So, um, <laughs> but, um, so that allows people to connect, and they will connect, not only there will be more people to connect with, but also they will connect happily and safely and in a good mood, and they will have good and interactions that are full of belonging. So communal spaces that are nice to be in, that encourage a sense of value, you are valued because we cared enough for you to make a space like this in your community and motivate social gatherings. But also, um, this move towards the, the, ira the um, disappearance of what we call third places, third spaces, like shops, neighborhood shops, uh, the, the barber, the, the flower shop, the, um, the place uh, uh, where you can go and buy um, things to sew with. I, sorry, my words are gone. Um, so these places tend to close in, in residential areas and then to be moved to areas that are more like shopping areas. But that can be really damaging to people's sense of connection, to people's opportunity to interact with others. Um, we need to improve public transport and ensure that it is safe, accessible and affordable. The three things at the same time is quite rare to find. We need to be deliberate about inclusion in each context and for each group. We cannot go into a school or a workplace with a template about what it means to be inclusive. Yes, we can have some suggestions, we can have some ideas, but we need to talk to the people in question and talk about their specific issues, what, what do they feel excluded by and how that how alternatives could work. And we need to educate and be open uh, different, about different ways of being sociable. So I want to end with these statements. They're not mine, but I agree with them all wholeheartedly. So the hypocrisy of governments that talk about loneliness while systematically destroying key sources of social connectedness is breathtaking. To combat loneliness, we must be fiercely invested in combating colonialism, white supremacy, cis heteropatriarchy interphobia, ableism, sanism, and all other forms of oppression that cultivate the ideal conditions for loneliness to flourish. A good society is a society where people are not lonely. Thank you for listening, and if you want to contact me anytime, and these are the authors uh, that uh, have worked with me in all of this work. Thank you.